Hey guys, what's up? Tyler here. One of the most identifiable races from the Star Trek franchise, uh, dating all the way back to the original series, is the Orion species. Characterized by their green complexion, their reputation for piracy, and their sensual nature, the Orions operate one of the most significant trade networks in the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. But today, beyond just their socio-political and economic affairs, uh, I'd like to explore more deeply their biology and how it has influenced their standing on the interstellar stage. This is Star Trek Alien Biology, the Orions. One of the most striking aspects about the Orions is, as I mentioned earlier, their green skin. This has made them iconic in popular culture as an instantly recognizable element of the original series. Their first appearance in canon uh, was the season one episode of the original series, The Menagerie, which featured footage from the unaired pilot, The Cage. In the final draft of the script for The Cage, a line of dialogue that ultimately didn't make into the episode implied that green Orions were actually rare. This is likely because Gene Roddenberry had originally envisioned the Orions as having more variation, but due to budget constraints, this never came to fruition. They've also been known to possess hair color variations that include red, black, and green. Fun fact, when the green Orion makeup was originally tested on Module Barrett and Susan Oliver, the post-production lab sent back the footage three times before Gene Roddenberry had to tell them that the Orions were supposed to be green. In universe, it's interesting to consider what sort of evolutionary conditions would have led a sentient humanoid species to developing a green skin complexion. Some non-canon sources speculate that Orion skin pigments are actually based on chlorophyll, much like earth plants which have chloroplasts. Now this might initially seem like a silly idea, uh, as there's nothing other than green skin color to connect the Orions with Terran plant life, this actually might have some credence. As I explained in my video about the Asari from Mass Effect, uh, the coloration of various extraterrestrial species is likely heavily influenced by the wavelengths that are emitted by their planet's host star. In the Orion's case, their star, Pi 3 Orionis, is an F-type yellow-white star that is slightly hotter than ours. Because they are hotter, F-type stars, which have slightly shorter lifespans than our sun, by definition emit more light in the blue portion of the visible spectrum. Light of these wavelengths is more energetic and thus, being closer to the UV end of the spectrum, more harmful in high concentrations. It's for this reason that life on a planet orbiting an F-type star would need some kind of UV protection layer, such as an ozone layer. In the absence of such shielding, DNA molecules on uh, planets such as these would suffer between 2.5 and, and 7.1 times the amount of damage caused by UV radiation than on Earth. The coloration of pigments in life found around F-type stars is, of course, subject to some debate since we've obviously only observed life on one planet, Earth. But the knowledge that we do have regarding solar radiation and the way that various pigments absorb and reflect this radiation can give us some clues. As I just mentioned, F-type stars emit more light in the blue portion of the spectrum than our sun, and thus, according to astronomers, pigments in life found around these stars would behave in one of two ways. On the one hand, they could reflect this higher energy blue light and thus give off a bluer tint or they could absorb only the blue light and reflect lower energy wavelengths, namely red, yellow, and, you guessed it, green. And of course, as we see on Orion, the plant life is in fact green, just like the people who inhabit it. The sky even possesses a greenish tint, which is uh, rather unexpected. It would still probably be blue around an F-type star, but maybe there are other gases in the atmosphere that affect the scattering of shorter wavelengths. Anyway, just like the other life on their planet, Orions may have uh, skin pigments that are similar to chlorophyll. Additionally, non-canon sources describe historical populations of Orions with gray and red complexions, meaning that they may have had other pigments. This could jive with the concept of life on a planet orbiting an F-class star, reflecting more than just one narrow color band in the visible spectrum. However, these alternate colored Orions have not been featured in canon. Given that Orion's blood is green, it may also use the protein chlorochlorin, or a copper-based variant of hemoglobin, or 
even some combination of the two. Chlorochlorin is found in some marine worms, uh, but is actually bright green as opposed to the darker green found in Vulcans and presumably Orions. Regarding the age of their host star, whose real-world analog is noted on a star map in Star Trek Picard, Pi 3 Orionis is only 1.4 billion years old, according to the best estimates. Now, you might ask, what does this have to do with anything? Well, if we were to believe that humanoid life in the galaxy is in fact descended from uh, a progenitor race as suggested in the chase, then this presents two possibilities. Either the primordial genetic code of various species was transmitted via panspermia to planets younger than four and a half billion years old, possibly by some mechanism like the mycelial network. The mycelial network is like- Mycelial network! Where Pi 3 Orionis is not the Orion's original homeworld. In fact, both could be true and not be mutually exclusive. The Orions are said to have once been a highly advanced civilization with a rich archaeological history. The dawn of their civilization was even witnessed by the USS Enterprise crew in the pilot episode of the animated series Yesteryear. Non-canon sources suggest that their true origins have been wrapped up in mystery and marked by outside interference. They may have even been slaves themselves at one point continuing the practice after they rebelled against their oppressors. This murkiness might be indicative that the Orions originally evolved on a planet in another solar system, and that Pi 3 Orionis is merely their current home system, possibly dating back only a few thousand years. Whatever the case, Orion society, commonly recognized in conjunction with their slave trade, is largely influenced by yet another distinct biological characteristic pheromones. Orion females are known to emit highly powerful pheromones that affect the physiology of other species. In heterosexual males of some species, these pheromones uh, can trigger aggression and, in some cases, after cumulative exposure, trigger delusions of suggestibility. Heterosexual human females are shown to be unaffected uh, by the pheromones and, in fact, react negatively to them. And some species with higher mental disciplines such as Vulcans are effectively immune. Not all Orion females emit or utilize these pheromones, however, including Devon Attendee, my wife. These pheromones are, of course, uh, commonly associated with Orion slave women, a concept that is featured in multiple episodes of Enterprise. But of course, as we learn in the 22nd century, it is not the women who are the slaves, but the men. The women use their pheromones to wield power over their male counterparts. Some members of the Orion Syndicate even use the pheromones to affect the behavior of would-be slave masters of other species. With the true arrangement of gender roles in their society not being widely known for a very long time, Orion women would perpetuate this deception by allowing themselves to be sold on slave markets. It is possible that this arrangement has been reversed by the 23rd century, or perhaps the perception uh, maintained. But by the late 24th century, as we learned in Lower Decks, slavery and piracy have been outlawed in Orion society. Sexual dimorphism in Orions has also been more or less the norm in terms of the ones that we see on screen. Enterprise was actually the first time that we saw Orion males in live action. In Enterprise, males are shown to be bald, muscular, and very tall. But Star Trek Discovery has shown uh, more variety not only in Orion's skin color, uh, but also in the physical build of males. They're not all gigantic dudes. Imagine that. Variety of appearance in a humanoid species. Discovery also shows Orions engaged in bisexual polyamorous activity and introduces other facts about Orion biology, such as their hearts having six valves and being able to pump blood in both directions. Orions are a really fascinating species to me, particularly because we don't know as much about them in canon as we do about other species. Their history, as I mentioned, is clouded in mystery. Their culture, while dominated by piracy in older installments, is given more dimension in the newer installments. And their society and government being totally separate and independent from the Federation, a supposed utopia of the galaxy, is also very interesting to me. I haven't delved as deeply into Orion history and politics in this video as those topics have been covered in detail by other YouTubers as have uh, elements of their biology as well. But I think the fact that we're seeing more of them these days is uh, a great opportunity to expand on what has historically been a rather one-note species. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments of this video. Let me know if you feel like I missed something. Uh, also, if you want to help decide the next 
episode of Alien Biology or the next uh, uh, species in my Alien Species playlist, you can uh, respond to the pinned comment that I'll be putting down below and participate in the polls on my channel community tab. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. Uh, and of course, if you haven't subscribed, be sure to do that so you won't miss future uploads and be sure to click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a member or a patron. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description below. That's about all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.